Welcome back to Reading Bear. Today, we will take a look at some new Pori Ranch stories. And if you enjoyed my content, please don't forget to subscribe to my channel and post some bear emojis in the comments. Let's go! The first one is titled, Trash Your Own Manager and Department. You get to do a presentation. True story, names changed, years ago, yada, yada, yada. Chad was an engineer with a planning and support department for a portion of his company's infrastructure that impacted virtually every other part of the company. Unfortunately Chad was a realer hole. During less than a year with the company, he had thoroughly trashed everyone in his department to anyone who would listen. He talked about their incompetence, their screw-ups, which were generally minor, and most importantly their failure to properly support the very mission-critical infrastructure they were responsible for. Every hiccup that occurred, however minor, was used as ammunition. What Chad told everyone who would listen eventually made it up to managers and directors throughout the company. That wasn't enough though. Chad made the mistake of trashing his own director who was also his manager. Over the next few months there was no one even remotely involved with his department who didn't know what Chad was doing, including that manager. Chad's manager and director was Tim, a pretty crappy manager by most measures. He paid about 40% less than the industry average and had a staff of B and C players because of it, but he nevertheless expected absolute dedication from that staff. If he could have had them wash his car and pick up his dry cleaning those things would have been added to their job descriptions. Tim was also pretty poor when it came to understanding what his own staff did and routinely made things up about their work while talking to other people. Everyone involved knew he was full of crap because what he said made no sense at all. Most rolled their eyes, but people also knew that Tim was a force to be reckoned with. Despite his shortcomings as a manager, the one place Tim excelled was corporate politics. He was able to consistently come through failures without a scratch when those failures would have sidelined anyone else. Tim would deftly play opponents off one another, then stand back and watch the fireworks. He had been at it for years and seemed to have a Teflon coating. Crap that stuck to everyone around him would slide right off. Tim, of course, knew exactly what Chad had been saying. Eventually Chad's trashing of his own department became so severe and their reputation so tarnished that a large director's meeting was called to discuss the situation. The other department directors were out for blood. Enter Tim's pro revenge. Tim tasked Chad, the very person responsible for the company gossip that resulted in the high-level meeting, with the job of putting together and then presenting a formal defense against his own gossip. Chad had to spend the next couple of weeks creating a formal presentation and repeatedly submitting it to Tim for approval. The meeting rolled around and Chad was forced to stand up in front of a large group of company directors and managers and formally defend his own manager and department. Everyone at the meeting knew they were only there because of what Chad had been saying, and they sat back and watched him tear himself apart and prove the things he, himself had been telling everyone were flat-out lies. Of course Tim and his department came through completely unscathed, but Chad was thoroughly discredited throughout the company and knew it. He left that company for another within six months of that meeting and last was heard badmouthing everyone involved with his new company. The last one is titled, Friend, Let's Her Asshole Boyfriend Rob Me, I Get Her Kids Taken. This is a story of some revenge against three people. Sorry if it's a big read. I sort of rambled on. Before I met my current wife, I was engaged to a beautiful woman I didn't deserve, named Nami. Nami was the whitest Japanese person I had ever met. I don't mean she acted white, I mean she acted like a white girl who hung out with black people. At home she was all NASCAR and country music, her parents were particularly into those things, but out and about she was all rap music and hip hop. Though, not to the point where she acted ghetto. I can't really explain it. But this is important in context to me. Who is African American and I had, have less street cred than she does. I grew up in the suburbs and got picked on by other black kids for talking white or not being black enough. My only run in with the hood was when I was really little before my parents split. My mother was a bit of a drug user, though I don't think that's why her and dad split. Anyway, that's all to say that her interest in me was baffling at best. But we shared a lot of other interest and she was adorable. Though to this day I can tell you that woman can and I hope eventually did do better. 
Anyway, Nami had this friend, a white girl named Samantha. Samantha went to the same college as her, we'll call it generic state university, different one than I went to. I went to, bullshit for profit, would not recommend. Now in order to get me out of my dorm room and into more of a college life, Nami would take me to parties that Samantha and friends would be at. Samantha was either pledging or just hangers on to this sorority, but I know she wasn't in it. A lot of times I could hear those girls talking about how they only hung out with her because she bought them stuff. Her mum or dad apparently had money and was big into real estate or something. Despite not really fitting in with the crowds, I liked hanging out with Samantha because I liked her boyfriend, we'll call him Dr. Jekyll. He was cool, I thought, and looked out for me at the parties and even pointed out one time when one of the frat boys was crushing up on Nami, though she didn't need my help saying no. I wasn't the jealous type, more of the self-deprecating type. Instead of panicking about who she was with, or if she was cheating on me, I kind of just thought, well today is that day huh? Well, I had a good run. Just something about her always made me think that she would wake up one day and say, alright, I've done my public service for a while. And go be with the other beautiful people. Anyhow, I got really close to Dr. Jekyll and Samantha. Samantha was into Pokemon and Dr. Jekyll was into anime and football. Though he was more of a, whatever is on Toonami, anime fan, and didn't much like subtitles or anything not mainstream. And was a bandwagon Patriots fan, though all of his kid photos clearly showed he rooted for the Browns. Either way, we had a lot in common and the group of us would hang out. I would be left with Samantha when Nami and Dr. Jekyll went off to smoke weed, because I was lame and didn't do that. I thought Samantha didn't either, but I would find out later that she had had a huge drug problem in high school and was avoiding drugs. It was our routine and everything was great for a year, until it wasn't. One day at a party, Nami comes storming up and tells us we have to go. Dr. Jekyll is chasing after her and he looks panicked and tells her he was just kidding and high. I asked what happened, immediately thinking the worse, but she says nothing happened, and she just wanted to go home. I found out later some things that really bothered me. On the ride home Nami tells me that Dr. Jekyll tried to kiss her. She says he was drunk and high, but that's no excuse. She says he apologized, but she slapped him. She admitted that Dr. Jekyll had tried to ask her out before she dated me, but she didn't like him because of his reputation. But then he went after Samantha who ended up dating him. Since I had like zero confidence then, I asked her why, because Dr. Jekyll was obviously more good looking than me. Like, think Chad, muscles and everything. And she just told me to stop, and told me she was happy with me being her boyfriend. I asked if we should tell Samantha and she said she didn't know. This was the second time one of Samantha's boyfriends had made a move on her and she didn't know if she would be blamed. So she asked me not to tell Samantha until she figured out what to say. She spent all night trying to figure out what to send her on AIM, but eventually went to bed before sending the message. I got woke up by my computer going off, someone was blowing up my trillion. Samantha was trying to get a hold of me. She is upset because Dr. Jekyll told her Nami tried to get him to fool around with her, and when he rejected her, she slapped him. For a moment I entertained that thought. Not because I didn't trust Nami, but because well, why wouldn't someone want Dr. Jekyll over me? Self-esteem or not, it was more plausible than hot Japanese girls likes the borderline weabo. I dunno, I guess I'd spent the entire relationship waiting for the other shoe to drop. So I went and woke up Nami and asked her about it. She was not happy. I didn't accuse her of anything. I just kind of said that if she did prefer someone else that it'd be better if she just broke up with me. She did not like that and gave me this sigh she always gave me. The kind of sigh you give a puppy who can't quite make it up the stairs. I assure you, I'm confident about just about everything else in my life. Or rather, in certain skills and abilities I have. But, lover, catch, desirable man. Nah, not even a little bit. She reaches and gets her phone and shows me the texts where he's begging her not to tell me what happened and says flat out that he didn't mean to try to kiss her, it just happened. She asked me if I felt better. And I did, but I said no, because I didn't know what we were gonna do about Sam. She told me she would talk to Sam herself and told me to come back to bed, so I tried to put it out of my mind and went to sleep. 
The next month was the twilight ducking zone. So a few things I did not know. Turns out Dr. Jekyll is definitely Mr. Hyde, and will be referred to as this from here on out. So in order of what I found out secondhand from Nami, Sam, and Clara the Modi sorority girl who treated me like a pleb, but always sought me out to listen to her gossip. So we'll start with, Mr. Hyde has been ducking his way through that sorority. Like at least seven girls. I'd be impressed if it didn't definitely make me feel inadequate. Though she assured me Mr. Hyde had not slept with my girl. She accused my girl of being a something, I dunno, I had never heard the word at the time, and haven't heard it since, but it's apparently a girl who hangs around people with weed so she can bum weed. She's friendly and flirty, but has no interest in anything but free weed and leaves the moment anyone tries to reciprocate her flirtiness. Which makes me wonder if she had led him on. Though Clara didn't think so. Though I was warned that Nami's ex-boyfriend, Kent, who was tall and reasonably handsome, but was nerdier than I, was still hanging around try to find a way out of the friend zone. This is important because Kent was also Clara's boyfriend and Mr. Hyde's off-campus roommate, along with three others. Apparently Samantha didn't do weed at parties because she was already high, doing either coke or meth, I honestly didn't know this. The people who do those drugs have a certain look to them, and she didn't look like that. All bug-eyed and strung out. And she never seemed, wired. Like my mum did drugs, I know what someone looks like on coke, so I didn't believe her at first. Later it was confirmed by Nami and Sam. Nami found out that Mr. Hyde had Sam in some weird master-slave relationship, and she thought that he only slept with the girls, and guys, he brought home for them to share. Mr. Hyde was a drug dealer. Something Nami knew, but didn't tell me because I would have lost my crap. But didn't think that Sam was still using the heavier crap because Mr. Hyde only sold weed. But Mr. Hyde only sold weed at the parties, he apparently sold all kinds of other crap. And, when we finally got Sam to sit down and talk, we found out just how abusive Mr. Hyde was. She had track marks and scars, and bruises. I never paid attention to the way Samantha dressed because we lived somewhere cold. So long-sleeved shirts, sweaters, turtlenecks, that sort of thing, was common. And to be perfectly honest, I wasn't looking. And I felt like crap because I really liked Mr. Hyde. He seemed really cool and like took me under his wing and got me to open up and not be so damn lame. I kind of felt betrayed finding out that he was a scumbag. He used drugs and abuse, sexual, verbal, physical, to keep Sam in line. Sam was paying for everything for him and went broke because her parent had found out and cut her off. Apparently they went no contact, and Sam had just been eating through her school money. She was a mess and I did not know. So I went to confront Mr. Hyde. We were still cool, I thought, we could talk this out. The person I met at the door of his house was not the same bro who had befriended me. Looked out for me. Was there for me while I was around all those strangers. Dude was belligerent, aggressive, and disrespectful. I'm trying to talk to his butt, and he's like, 100% trying to cuss me out and fight me, calling me all out of my name and worse. Calling me a lame butt, n-word and all of that. Which, I'm sorry, I'm not as mild-mannered as I appear to be. I mean I got my butt kicked weekly growing up, so, you eventually learn to fight or keep getting your butt kicked. By the 11th grade, I had finally gotten big and tired enough of being bullied that I just fought back. I mean, my dad framed it, fight them or fight me, and I'm much more afraid of him. I mean, my dad's a marine, and he was mighty abusive. Once it got framed in my mind like, not one of these people can hit as hard as dad, I wasn't afraid to fight anymore. So, I wasn't about to let this silly butt white boy get away with too many more N-bombs. It ain't about that word having power over me, it's about the fact that you think you can say that, and I won't lay hands on you. You basically saying you can get away with the worst and I won't do nothing about it, and you're wrong. Listen, I don't have a gangster bone in my body. I am not, tough, but I'll say this, Carlton Banks was gonna beat his butt that day. So, I told him that Sam wasn't coming back and he needed to keep his hands to himself. And if he called me out of my name again, I was gonna crack his head to the white meat. I thought it sounded cool, it's something my sister Max always said. I know, I'm lame, but it really sounded good at the time. So, he's got his boys behind him geeking him up. 
Kent's the only one telling him this may not be a good idea. Yada, 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 he ain't a no mouse SR, so I ain't afraid of him. Well Kent was right, wasn't a good idea. He got a butt whooping, I enjoyed making him less handsome than me, and was cool with an ego boost. Anyway, after that, I say Sam can stay with us until she can get on her feet and I think I've done good. I was the good man and I should be praised. I don't know why I don't ever see me being wrong coming, but it comes and it always surprises. So, Sam's not happy. For a lot of reasons, mostly because she thinks it's gonna get taken out on her, and she is mad at beat his butt. She says she understands but doesn't sound like she does. More surprising is that Nami is mad at me. Upset I offered to let Sam stay with us. Sam is her friend. So, no one is happy with me. Not even me. Because after a while it sinks in the Mr. Hyde was my only male friend in that new city and once the adrenaline wore off, I felt like crap. Now, I'd love to say things got better from there. But they did not. Sam's presence was a problem and keeping her from doing drugs in the house was a chore. Nami didn't even smoke weed in the house and Sam had been trying to get other things in the house. Nami would find it in her things. Sam drank, Sam was messy, and Sam did not respect boundaries. She would walk around half naked and though she was attractive in theory, the condition of her body was a huge turn off. That and the fact that I knew that they'd ran a train on her and all that, I just couldn't see her as a sexy being, even though she had talked to me about a poly thing. I think that she just was worried that Nami would kick her out, and she was working me to find a way to stay in. But living with her showed me another side of her, and I don't think I could have ever dated her. Crap got worse when it turned out Sam was pregnant and it was most definitely gonna be Mr. Hyde's, cause he's the only person she had had sex with raw, apparently. Now, Nami took me aside and told me she didn't want Sam there anymore, but I was reluctant to kick a pregnant woman out and I suggested we talk to her parents, or get her some money to get her own place. Her presence caused a huge problem with me and Nami, and it only got worse when we both came home from school, work, and a lot of crapper value was gone. TVs, my gaming rig, Nami's laptop, video game systems, and I had a lot, bitch took my Neo Geo AES and my Jaguar which I still haven't replaced. I mean I collected games. The only reasons she didn't get all of my systems is they were locked up in storage cores me and Nami had just moved in together, we'd only been in that place for like 6 months when this went down. I was upset. But not as much as Nami who didn't say crap to me, just went in the room and locked the door. Got a message on Trillion that same day, I still had my laptop. It's usually attached to me. It was Sam saying that she didn't want her kid to be raised without a father and she knew Nami didn't want her there so she was trying to move out. She decided to tell Mr. Hyde about the pregnancy and perhaps try again as he deserved the chance to be a father to his kids. But Mr. Hyde was mad that apparently Sam chose me over him, like any woman would ever, and that no man would be so nice or generous to a girl if they wasn't ducking. So to prove her loyalty he asked her to open up my house to him and let him and his skeevy drug dealer friends rob me. She apologized, saying she had to put her family first. I was so ducking upset. I went over there with the intention of beating his butt, but he wasn't there. Ken said he hadn't seen him in weeks. Turns out he was paying them with weed and apparently one of the people Mr. Hyde was ducking was the girlfriend of his supplier, who was now looking for him to beat his butt and collect for money he owed for getting high on his own supply. Though Clara had said that him and his friend Dogbone, and no that is not even a made up name like the rest of them, this dude was called Dogbone, I'm not changing it, nothing I could come up with would ever be as ridiculous as ducking Dogbone. Anyway Dogbone was seen moving their stuff out and said he was driving out to the next state to live with his uncle. There were more details, but nothing helpful, other than that Dogbone apparently had Sam with him when they picked up the stuff. So that's what happened, what follows is what I did about it. I didn't get my revenge right away. Couldn't find them. Sam wasn't online no more and it took two months for Nami to stop side-eyeing me. This didn't contribute to the end of our relationship, which came two years later, but, I don't think it helped. I'll just say be communicative with your partner about your medical issues. If you isolate yourself for nine months, your partner's gonna feel neglected, unloved, and unwanted, and a girl like that ain't gonna wait around for a guy like me to get his crap together. 
That's free advice. Anyhow, like all people who snitch on themselves, this group of losers' choice of self-snitching was Facebook. Apparently life in the next state over was not going so hot for Sam. She contacted me on Facebook all apologetic and telling me she's sorry me and Nami broke up and saying she apologized if her thing had anything to do with it. I didn't respond at first. She then went on about how she had two beautiful baby girls, and how life in where she was living wasn't great. She wanted to know if I would send her some money, because she was finally trying to get away from Mr. Hyde and could I help her. At first, I just sent her a clip of Invader Zim laughing. And let it at that. But later she sends me more messages talking about how he got more violent and was violent with the girls and how she didn't like having to sleep with Dogbone, who was his boyfriend, apparent Hyde was bi, I should have known that from earlier, but I didn't. So that surprised me and also made me wonder if Mr. Hyde had been feeling me out, I didn't think so. She also said she didn't like the way Dogbone was with her twins, and implied maybe something odd was going on there. I wasn't about to fall into the trap, I was still angry, but the mention of kids did break my resolve a bit. I told her she was lying to manipulate me and all that and she sent me pictures. Pictures of her, pictures of her body, not naked, but bra and panties and, she did look like a crackhead now. But the point was to show me her bruises. She was a mess. But what was worse, was her little girls didn't look too hot either. Two little blonde, green-eyed twins. So, against my better judgment I called Nami, though it breaks my heart, I ask if she still has Sam's mum's number, she gives it to me and tells me to be careful. I tell her what's up and she chides me about being gullible, but I assure her I'm not. I thank her and call Sam's mum and tell her everything, she is surprised, she didn't even know she had grandkids and had been looking for Sam. I contacted Sam and told her to contact her mum, she refuses. I tell her to call me on Skype, she does, and while we're talking on Skype a few things happen. 1. I see their stash. There's a little hidden trapdoor that is under the bed, that I very clearly see as Dogbone walks behind her and gets a baggie from it. Second thing is, I hear, whispering, Mr. Hyde coaching her on how to get money out of me. I pretend I don't hear, but the game is up when one of the girls comes in calling out to him and Sam's trying to hush her. I hit print screen to catch everything, over and over again. Print screen, control V, in Photoshop which I have open. This room is evidence central. I agree to send her money and ask her for her address. She gives it to me. I tell her that I'm going to send her help and I do. First thing I did was call her mother and told her what I was doing. I also emailed her the print screens. Drug crap all in the room with kids. I then look up the local police number and dropped the dime on Dogbone, Sam, and Mr. Hyde. Sam left her school ID and plenty of crap when she left us. I have all her information. Mr. Hyde I know his full name, date of birth, and all that. And Dogbone I knew nothing about. I lay down a thick story about negligence, drug abuse, child abuse and all that. Step 1 done. Step 2, I called Clara and asked Clara which of her friends was dating the drug dealer. She put me in touch, turns out, he left owing them a great deal of money, so much that the guy offered me $500 just for the whereabouts. I was happy to oblige though I told him about Sam, the kids, and the situation and suggested he visit after the police did his thing. Weird thing was, drug dealer guy knew me, or knew of me. You that guy that used to date Nami. It was humbling, finding out she was dating some douche wheel call scoop. Eventually Clara called me back and asked if I knew where Dogbone was. Apparently Dogbone had three kids he left behind when he ran off with Mr. Hyde. His wife, not girlfriend, legal wife, still married, was looking for him for child support and all kinds of crap. Apparently Dogbone didn't have any uncles and whomever they were with was not actually related to him. I gave her the address and wished her luck, I also sent her the pictures I had taken. Especially since I got several shots of Dogbone in the background smoking something in front of the kids. Aftermath. So take this all with a grain of salt because my first hand knowledge ends here. The rest of this comes from Sam's mother. So the police arrested them all and took the kids. Sam's mum got her granddaughters, and last I heard has been fighting for custody of them. 
The police had enough to charge them all, but, apparently they got out on bail a few weeks later, but, Mr. Hyatt ended up in the hospital. Someone apparently put really, really, bad beating on him. I wouldn't know who. Never got that 500, I don't think it was a real offer. Dogbone 2. Sam apparently got smacked around, I feel bad about that, but her mum says that was about it. Because she was trying to protect Mr. Hyde. I'm not sure the extent of the damage on Mr. Hyde, but, I do know they broke both his arms and his jaw was wired shut. Dogbone, don't know how bad his was. I heard from Clara, who I was seeing casually at the time, we started hooking up after I got back in touch with her. She wasn't dating Kent anymore, he went back east after college, that year, Dogbone's wife found him and rained hot misery on his butt. And apparently he was running from some serious warrants. So, he's boned. I'd like to think that everyone got what was coming to them, with the added bonus that I hope Sam lost her kids forever and there with her mum. She was a good lady. Clara and I never dated. We hooked up a few times, but, given some medical issues, I wasn't prime duck buddy material at the time. I didn't get any of my stuff back. But, I learned a valuable lesson about helping people. Or somewhat, this isn't actually the last time I tried to help a viper and got bit, but at least I stopped letting trifling folks stay at my house, and I've never tried to be Captain Save a Ho ever again. Also, not that it matters, I am the only black person in this story. I write this because for some reason every time I tell it, people ask me. Thanks for listening.